This is Robert Kraft, and I'm your host for SNN Network. And joining me today is Chris Schelling. He is the CEO and founder of Acer Therapeutics. It's a publicly traded company. The symbol is A-C-E-R on NASDAQ. Chris, thank you for joining me today. Yeah, thanks, Robert. Thanks for having me. It's great to have you on. Uh, now, before we get into the story of the company, I have to ask first, how's everyone holding up? Healthy, safe? How's everyone going? Doing a okay, yeah. Super, super blessed. Doing all great. All family and friends are are healthy and happy, so we're good. Thanks. Good, good to know. Good to hear. All right, so segue to more information about COVID because one of the reasons I, I had you on today is that the company has put out uh, several news releases and and news about uh, dipping your toe into the COVID uh, nineteen. I guess we call it a race, so to speak. You know, mm -hmm. and and because really we are in a race to want to get anywhere from a vaccine, treatment, testing, more testing kids, everything out there. So, you know, um, give us a little bit of background on what you're doing there first, and then we'll go into a little overview and history of the company. Sure. You got it. Yeah. I mean, this is kind of a common or recent phenomena for Acer, as I'm sure it is a lot of people developing in this area. Um, about two months ago, as COVID was coming across the pond into the United States, uh, we, we started to take note of it. And while we didn't have uh, publicly announced a, a program that was in, involved in as an antiviral or COVID-19, uh, we had actually for the last two and a half years been working with NCATS, a division of NIH, uh, looking at a compound that they were interested in as an antiviral, a drug called emetine hydrochloride. Um, originally, when we picked up that conversation back in 2018, the goal was to see whether the drug had utility against the human side of megalovirus, we know it as the herpes virus, um, in work that they were doing with Johns Hopkins. Uh, they were also talking with the U.S. government about studying uh, the role of emetine against other viruses like uh, Zika and Ebola and dengue viruses. So they approached us knowing that we focus on repurposing and reformulating drugs uh, for areas of uh, significant unmet medical need in, in rare and life-threatening disorders. So we picked up the conversation and said, this seems like a really interesting compound, something we should get involved in. And we're looking at it specifically for those purposes. Um, in March of this year, we obviously, with COVID coming across, we said, you know, what are your guys' thoughts about emetine and its potential utility there? There was a publication uh, printed last year by Shen uh, that looked at the other forms of coronavirus. There's seven total, including SARS-CoV-2. And it, it looked at emetine's role against coronavirus and showed um, significant nanomolar potency of the drug against other coronaviruses like MERS and SARS. And so in the conversation, they said, look, we think the drug's fantastic. Uh, we talked with NIAID about this. We think that this should be one of the top priorities. We just need an industry sponsor. And I said, let's do this. So for the last two months, we've been working round the clock, seven days a week, 14, 16 hour days, trying to advance this program to see if it uh, in fact has utility against SARS-CoV-2. So quick follow up there, you know, some of my audience may not know all the different stages for, you know, the various trials and preclinicals and all that. So what sure. stage is the company currently at in developing this therapeutic? Yeah, so the, the compound's a really interesting compound and it has a really interesting history. So the, the drug itself has been used in humans for almost 100 years. Uh, originally, it was studied as an injectable for the treatment of dysentery, uh, which was a, a common you know, uh, infection, amoebic infection of the GI um, a long time ago for, because of dirty water conditions, um, obviously less common today. Um, and then it was also an active ingredient in something that people may know more about, Ipecac syrup. So this was something you used to be able to buy at the grocery store. If your kids poisoned themselves, you could give them Ipecac and it would induce vomiting. So uh, it was uh, really uh, available to, to people to take up until about 10, 20 years ago. And then it just disappeared. Um, maybe better drugs or, or more efficient drugs were on the market. So the drug has been studied in humans and been used for you know, thousands of people over 100 years or so. And then, like I said, it just went off the radar in the last you know, 20 years or so. So for us, you know, there's a lot of data that's out there. There's a lot of safety data, a lot of uh, pharmacology data. It allows us to, I think, move fairly quickly. So we're proposing, and we're talking with the FDA right now, proposing of moving this into a phase two, three study, uh, clinical study. So we're looking at going right into humans 
and this is a, a study that could be, um, you know, really demonstrate the safety and efficacy in this population, and then you know expand it to a much larger group of people uh, to to determine whether this is a true antiviral uh, against uh, COVID nineteen. So it's if it shows good data there, we could very quickly move into uh, uh, clinical, you know, actual commercial use. I was going to say that you know. At least, you know, from listen, I've done I've done a number of interviews with companies um, in the last two months that are working on therapeutic vaccine, you know, uh, testing kits and whatnot. You know, mm -hmm. so it's it's pretty interesting to see because you're going about this at, because it's a repurposing of a drug mm -hmm. for this indication that you're able to almost kind of, so to speak, skip some steps. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, that's what we've tried to do at Acer all along with all of our programs. It's, to, you know, where there's this significant unmet medical need, you find these drugs that have an, a, a pretty significant amount of existing literature, right, support the fact that it's been in humans, maybe for a different disease or in a different geography, but it allows you to skip a lot of steps there and then, and then fill in the gaps where it's really pertinent for where we're trying to go. So in this case, COVID-19. If we wanted to study in some of these other uh, viruses, you know, we would be able to do clinical studies there as well. But it's not really having to go all the way back. So it saves time and money and uh, really accelerates the development timeline significantly. Got it. So, so to kind of to close the book on, on this discussion on, on the COVID-19 indication, you know, from mm -hmm. what you can tell us, what are the next steps right now with, with the FDA and moving this forward? Yeah, so we're talking with the agency right now. We submitted a briefing package, a pre-IND briefing package to them back in April. We already received written comments back from them. Uh, we're pulling together some answers to the questions that they have. Our goal is to resubmit to the FDA and hopefully, if they agree, uh, issue us an, uh, allow us to submit our IND here by middle of June. So if everything goes really well, knock on wood, you know, we have the potential to put them, you know, be in the clinic here in the early third quarter. Got it. So, you know, it's, I'm now, now we're going to take a step back because Acer has had a history even prior to, you know, uh, focusing on this indication. It, actually, what's been commonplace with the, with the few companies that I've spoken with is, you know, the, the change of focus a little bit because at the end of the day, we're dealing with a true global humanitarian crisis. But, you know, as with those similar other companies, they've had other indications that they've been working on and other programs in place. So, you know, to take that step back, let's, let's get a quick overview of, of Acer and some of the things you guys have been working on up until, you know, a couple of months ago. Yeah, absolutely. So as I mentioned, you know, we focus on repurposed, reformulated assets. And so we actually have three other clinical stage programs that, that are in development. Uh, the lead compound up until just recently was a, a drug called Edsevo. This was, uh, uh, the generic name of that is Celebrolol. This was a compound that had been approved in Europe back in the 1980s for treatment of high blood pressure and angina. Um, in the 90s and early 2000s, there was a French research group that studied the drug for a rare genetic disease called vascular Ehlers-Danlos syndrome. And uh, they showed really good data. So they've been treating patients with, uh, they call it VEDS, treating patients with VEDS for the last 20 years. Um, this is a rare genetic disease, uh, autosomal dominant, so family members, you'll have 10, 15 family members who might have this disease. And they don't produce collagen in their blood vessels. And so this drug has shown that you can significantly improve the event rate, in other words, the time to a catastrophic cardiovascular event by being on the therapy. Um, since they published that data in 2010, uh, the drug has become the, the gold standard of care for VEDS patients throughout Europe because it's available over there. Um, in about 2014, I had a good friend of mine who's the head of genetic, uh, genetics at Baylor College of Medicine reach out to me and said, look, we treat these VEDS patients and they have no, I mean, they have no therapy, right? We, we manage them, but we don't treat them. And yet there's this drug in Europe that looks fantastic. Is there a way that you can get the drug approved here in the U.S.? So we undertook that effort. We said, Let, let's go get the data. Let's, let's come through it. Let's talk with the FDA. And uh, we submitted an NDA at the end of 2018 uh, for the treatment of VEDS here in the U.S. Uh, FDA came back last June and issued what's called a complete response letter on that program saying they needed to see some more information. At the time, the other information that they wanted to see actually had to do with another clinical trial. Um, we pushed back and said, we, we don't think another clinical trial is warranted here. We think we can collect some additional data, um, uh, uh, supportive data that might be enough to get this thing across the finish line. So we're in discussions with the agency right now about how much data and what type of data do they need to see in order to potentially get this drug approved here in the United States. 
but huge unmet need, like I said, no, no, uh, no treatment options for these patients. Median age of death is 50 years of age. So an ability to, to create a therapy for these patients that's safe and, and could potentially decrease their, their risk of events and whatnot, um, is a, it, it could be a huge benefit for the, that patient population. Got it. Yep. So, 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 so yeah, go ahead. Got it. Got it. So, so my next question is, this is really a, a corporate philosophy question because, it, mm -hmm. you know, sometimes I've spoken with a few companies that, that have similar um, strategy where they're repurposing drugs for different indications. And to me, it's always been kind of like a chicken or the egg story where it's like, well, is it, are you finding the drug first and then figuring out the indication that you're going to go after later? Or, hey, there's these indications that have unmet medical needs. And now, I, now I'm out there looking for things that, you know, to repurpose for that, you know, so what, what's, mm -hmm. what's Acer's philosophy on this? I would say it's both. Uh, I don't think we necessarily stick, put the stake in the sand and say, you know, let's find a, a disease and then go hunt for a drug. Sometimes it's just a matter of finding a drug that looks really interesting, right? That has a unique mechanism of action and then saying, well, what's the story behind how that drug works? I mean, it really is a story about biochemistry. So I'll give you an example, and this isn't an ACER drug, but you know, um, a long time ago, Celgene, which is a pretty well-known company, they just sold for $74 billion last year to Bristol-Myers. Um, you know, in the beginning, they had developed a drug uh, called thalidomide. And this was a compound back in the 1950s and 60s that was used for pregnant women to help them sleep better. Um, what happened though, was that the kids were born without arms and legs and nobody understood it. So there was this huge, Everybody banned thalidomide, don't use it. But scientists went back and said, why are we seeing what we're seeing with this drug? And rather than throwing the baby out with the bathwater in that case, they said, oh, this drug is one of the first anti-angiogenic drugs that stops the formation of blood vessels. This is why kids you know, in utero aren't, aren't developing arms and legs. And so what they found was, is, well, that might not be good for pregnant women, but it's fantastic for cancer. And so uh, off-label, they studied it in multiple myeloma. It became the gold standard of care for multiple myeloma patients in the United States and generated $400 million in revenue. So there's a drug that they said, you know, here's the drug. We're not looking for a home for it. We're just trying to understand how this drug works. And once you understand it, you know, where does it make sense for you to slot that drug in? We did the same thing with uh, our, our drug of Sanitant that we acquired from Sanofi last year. So Sanitant... Uh, targets the neurokinin-3 receptor in the brain. It's actually in the hypothalamus. And it was originally developed by Sanofi for the treatment of schizophrenia. So they, they studied it for probably 15 years, took it through phase two, a thousand patients were on this drug. And at the end of the day, they decided, well, it's not showing good enough data in schizophrenia. Well, flash forward about 10, 15 years later, and now people have started studying NK3 receptor and realized, oh, it's not so much that it's good for schizophrenia, but that's a target that's really uh, of interest in, in vasomotor symptoms, um, menopausal-like symptoms. And so there's one other NK3 receptor antagonist that's in development right now by Astellas, and they're studying it for uh, menopause, women who are in menopause. Um, that's not our therapeutic area that we're interested in. So we acquired the rights from Sanofi, and we said, actually, there's some other populations that I think have a much greater unmet need. These are cancer patients who are on drugs, or undergo surgery that induce these tremendous vasomotor symptoms. And so they get hot flashes and irritability and night sweats. And what you find are patients who are on the drug usually cease their treatment, you know, 50, 60, 70% earlier than they should um, because they can't tolerate it. So they're on a, a drug like tamoxifen for breast cancer. They should be on it for 10 years because their outcomes are substantially better. Most of them are only on for about three and a half, four years because they just can't tolerate it. So they go off of it. So their quality of life gets better, but then their outcomes, you know, survivability and stuff might get worse. So there's another example of a drug that with a, a new known mechanism of action and applying it in a place where we think provides significant benefit to these patients. Got it. So and what's your background? I mean, you, you know, you're the founder of this company, but, you know, what was your background prior to founding Acer? Yeah, so, um, so I actually went to school for uh, medicine. I was going to go pre-med and uh, graduated and started applying for medical school and uh, ended up actually taking a job just to pay some bills uh, as a pharmaceutical sales rep. And so I got in carrying a bag and found that I actually really enjoyed um, pharmaceuticals. I, I like biochemistry and, and understanding how these drugs work and where else they could be applied. And so um, I actually scrapped my plans to go to medical school and just stayed in the industry. So, you know, it's 20 plus years later, um, I really focused on um, commercial strategy, commercial development, 
and uh, and then applying kind of that more biochemistry background to it. So it bridges the two worlds. It's how do we develop drugs and create a, a home for them? What's the story there? And then how do you actually take that through to commercialization where you can create a, a commercially viable product? Listen, I just hope you didn't break your parents' heart when you said, look, uh, not going to go the medical school route. You know, I'm just you know, I'm gonna try this other. I'm gonna try the pharmaceutical industry. I, I hope it didn't hurt them too bad. Yeah, no, they 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 got over it eventually. So <laughs> <laughs> okay, that's good. That's good. So uh, so my next question is, you know, from from what you can tell us, and and you've alluded to this a little bit when we were discussing the the COVID nineteen indication. You know, what, what what's your vision for the company now for the rest of 2020 and beyond? Yep. Yeah, I mean, I really envision advancing our pipeline. Like I said, we've got you know four products now with the COVID product, and I haven't even talked about Acer 001, but there's a kind of a steady news flow here between now and the end of the year on each of our programs, and whether that's you know um, you know generating clinical data with emetine in COVID, whether that's you know establishing a clear path forward for uh, Edsevo in VEDS. Uh, for Acer 001, we're looking at um, uh, sharing some new data on that program and then hopefully filing our, our NDA the, for, for approval in, in the first quarter of next year. So pulling that all together and making sure we've got a straight a, a agreement with the FDA and a straight path forward there. And lastly, with, with Osanitan, it's really you know getting the, the drug and everything teed up to uh, enter the clinic in the beginning of next year as well. So you know, if we do our job well, the idea is we should have good steady news flow generate value for the company, raise some money for the company. That's an important consideration as well. Um, all with an eye towards, you know, getting these products um, to patients as quickly as possible. Perfect. Well, with that, where can my audience go and find more information about Acer Therapeutics and to follow along as, uh, as the news comes public? Yeah, best place probably is just on our website. It's www.acertx.com. And uh, we also have a, a, a burgeoning presence in social media too. So it's a great way to get kind of more up-to-date information there. But um, yeah, those are, I'd say are the two best places to get information on Acer at this time. Fantastic. Well, Chris, thank you so much for joining me today. I really do appreciate it. Good luck, stay safe, and uh, I look forward to our next update. Sounds great. Thanks, Robert. Really appreciate it. Thank you, Chris. Mm -hmm.